The Seahawks have a new offensive coordinator then, and it is Ryan Grubb. The worst kept secret in football has finally been uh, confirmed that he is going to be coming back to uh, the Pacific Northwest and uh, replacing Shane Waldron. He is going to be the man tasked with creating the offense that Mike McDonald is going to hope can lead the Seahawks to glory. And look, I think there's a number of different ways to look at this. I think a lot of the reaction on social media and on Seahawks Twitter has been jubilation. I suspect there's a lot of crossover there between sort of Seahawks fans and Washington fans. Part of that is going to be a bit of, you know, laughing at Kalen DeBoer and Alabama, which I understand. Part of it is going to be having sort of gone through this incredible journey over the last couple of years with Washington, with Ryan Grubb as the offensive coordinator and sort of being excited about the prospects of something similar maybe happening in Seattle. You know, I, I think as personally not being a Huskies fan and being able to take a step back from this, my sort of reaction to not just this hire, but the whole, now that we kind of know, because we've obviously got position coaches still to come in, but we know who the key players are going to be with the coaching staff now. We know who the coordinator is going to be. We know who the head coach is going to be. So to my overall takeaway from it is it's intriguing. I am not going to say home run, smashing it out of the park, got everything right, because I don't think you can really say that unless you're reaching a little bit for positives, because there is just so much of an unknown. You have got a first-time head coach who was a defensive coordinator for two years. You've got an offensive coordinator who's never even coached in the NFL. Your defensive coordinator has only ever been a position coach in the past, and your special teams coordinator has changed. And, and likewise, he's not been a thing around. He's not been a special teams coordinator in the NFL, and he's replacing a guy who, in fairness, has been very successful in Seattle. So there are a lot of unknowns there. The only real sort of proven, experienced hire is Leslie Frazier. And that is why he was so important. And why, when that announcement was made, talked about it in the most positive terms, because it is absolutely vital to have somebody on this staff who has been there, done it, and can offer advice. I would suggest not just to Mike McDonald, but maybe to some of these other coaches as well. So it's a real unknown. But I'm comfortable living in that world where there's a bit of mystery. If they hadn't have made the changes that they've made, I think we'd have the opposite. I think it'd be totally predictable going into next season with the greatest respect to Pete Carroll. I think it would have been more of the same. It would have been another eight, nine win season, maybe make the playoffs, maybe not lose three or four times to the Niners and Rams. I mean, it would have been, you know, the same kind of press conferences every week. We've just got to fix the pass rush. We've just got to fix the downs. We've just got to, you know, do you know what I mean? We've kind of done that for years now and it needed to be something different. And whenever you make a hire, yeah, you'd love to sort of come out of the hire thinking, wow, now I really believe that we're going to be amazing straight away. I think there's only really one team, the Chargers, who can feel that confident about it, mainly because they've got a lot of the pieces that they need. Franchise quarterback, pass rushers, you know, players at other positions. They've invested a high pick in a left tackle. And now they bring in Harbour and they'll be, you know, their fans, as few of them as there are, will be thinking, well, they could maybe have a run straight away, that they can go for it. I think every other team who has changed staff this year, there is a bit of a, how is this going to go? We don't really know. And the Seahawks are very much in, in that sort of place. But I'm comfortable with it. You know, I'm intrigued to see what happens. You know, when that first game kicks off, I'm not going to be thinking, ah, here we go again, you know, another season of this. It's going to be like edge of your seat stuff. What's this going to look like? And that is just, I think, a better world to live in. My expectations are not going to be particularly high this year because of the inexperience, but I'm I'm going to enjoy, like I say, living with the mystery whilst also accepting that I think there are going to be some significant growing pains this year. That has to be. And how the Seahawks handle that is going to be very interesting. How McDonald handles it as a head coach how the Seahawks handle if things don't go well in certain areas, how will they view certain coaches, such as the offensive coordinator, I think is going to be very, very interesting. So, yeah, fascinating, intriguing, mysterious. Those are the kind of words that I prefer to use than just saying the Seahawks have nailed it or done a brilliant job or, you know, deserve praise yet, because I think the jury's out, but there's nothing wrong with that. So back on to Ryan Grubb. Um, you know, I... I know people who have been around uh, Grubb. I don't know him 
personally at all, as you'd probably expect. Um, but I do know people who've been around him. So I've kind of tried to find out what he's like. I think the really encouraging thing in a positive sense is that I was told he is a really gifted play caller, that this is going to be sort of a, a big thing for him. It has been Kalen DeBoer's system, and that has to be remembered. It is not that Grubb has crafted this scheme and then he's just going to bring it to Seattle uh, or he's going to like necessarily craft his own scheme now. That's where the mystery with him is going to be. How is he able to make a pro offense? Because in college, he ran DeBoer's offense. But as a play caller in those sort of situational moments, and when I, when I look, I didn't dig deep into, you know, sort of, what actually makes him a gifted play call. But what I would sort of interpret that from is that he is creative. He comes up with good game plans. It's situational football. You know, this is like second and eight. This is what we're going to call. He gets it right more often than not. No play caller is 100% right all of the time, but he gets it right more often than not. And that he will be able to adjust when needed because that is so important. So I think that's the really encouraging thing. And it's probably one of the, the big things, probably the big thing that appeals to the Seahawks in that if they'd have gone with Tanner Engstrand or maybe some of these other guys, they haven't called plays before. That is, you know, the unknown with them. They might come from proven NFL systems and they can maybe borrow some of that. But as we saw with Shane Waldron, you know, we did not get the McVay offense. We did not get a prolifically consistent, brilliant offense by going and plucking from the McVay tree with Shane Waldron. So plucking from maybe Detroit's tree doesn't guarantee anything anyway. They have gone and got a very gifted play caller, which, you know, was, was really important and, um, you know, fascinated to see how he gets on. You know, the challenges that he is going to face, I think they've got to master that game-to-game -game planning because I think under Pete Carroll's offense, you know, not just with Shane Waldron with others, it was pretty much we are who we are. We're going to try and do what we do. I mean, listen, I'm not an X's and O's guy, so I can't dig into the weeds again of exactly what the approach was game to game. But it did feel a little bit like when they played common opponents, for example, they didn't really have anything new to challenge these teams with. So I think they have to do a bit of that. Uh, I want to see the Seahawks exploiting opponent weaknesses more often than they are, getting the most of their skilled players. I, you know, I still think that in, in DK Metcalf, there is a top five receiver in there in terms of production we've never had that he's, he's been generally productive but not to the extent that he could be so let's see more from him from Jackson Smith and Jigba from the running backs that you've invested in you know I think that's that's really important they do need to be innovative and creative I hope that Ryan Grubb will spend some time watching Detroit and what they did to San Francisco because they asked so many different questions there were so many different styles of play and I, look, I think all teams are going to be watching what the Lions did because there is a lot to learn from them and their systems so I think he probably will be spending a bit of time watching them. And I, and I think you can learn from that. They've got to mask the misdirection. You know, at the moment, that is the hot thing on offense. It is sort of the, you know, motion players out, shifting the defense to expect to go one side and you go the other. Misdirection is so important in the NFL in the modern day. They've got to do that. They've got, and they need explosive plays. You know, you need to be able to hit a, a good number of explosive plays. And and this is becoming a long list, they have to see emphatic improvement in the red zone and on third downs, especially in the red zone, because they just simply, every time the Seahawks got in the red zone this year, it felt like it, they weren't going to score. So that's a lot on the plate of a first-time NFL coach, let alone a first NFL offensive coordinator. So we will see how he gets on, but they are some of the, the big challenges, and he has he's going to have to build the scheme. You know, there is not somebody else who's going to do it for him. My McDonald will... I'm sure offer import, but Grubb may well be locking himself in a room for the next fortnight and working out what the Seahawks are going to look like and what they're going to try and be. The style in which, do you know, what, I'm going to come on, I'll come on to the style in a bit because I, I, I've talked about this before and I think there's something else I want to talk about first. I mentioned the positive about being a gifted play caller. You know, I, I will just say that. One of the things that I've heard is that he's a very hard worker, but he also demands a lot. And although he communicated very well with Michael Penix, and I imagine he's going to have a very close and very strong relationship with Seattle's starting quarterback, he maybe needs to consider how he is going to approach 
coaching NFL players that maybe at times he he expects a lot and he's not the most agreeable person, not the easiest to like at times. But look, college is college. NFL is NFL. When you are in college and you've got young guys who are trying to make a name for themselves and are starting out their careers, you will try to, you know, mold them into certain individuals who can, one, have success, two, get in the real world, three, prepare themselves for what potentially could come next in the pros. When you're in the NFL, you are coaching players who have gone through all of that. Some of them have had a great deal of success. Some of them are now earning way more money than any of the coaches in Seattle are earning. And they've also got a lot more NFL experience than Ryan Grubb. So he probably is aware of this. I'm, I'm not doing I'm speaking out of turn. I think he probably needs to think about how he is going to uh, coach NFL players versus college players. Do I, am I worried about this at all? Hell no. And quite frankly, I don't care if uh, part of me thinks a little bit like, you don't want everybody to, to hate your offensive coordinator, but I also don't feel like I need to hear that he's everybody's best friend either. Like, I have to say, I'm a bit bored of hearing about culture. I'm a bit bored of hearing how it's so important for everything to be positive all of the time. I, I, I don't doubt for a second that having a great feeling around a place, having the vast majority of people enjoying coming to work is, is a kind of environment that gets the most out of people. I don't dispute that at all. But I do think at times you need people around you who go, that ain't good enough. Do this instead. Be better. I think everybody needs a kick up the backside sometimes. And I don't know, when I heard Pete Carroll say, when he was asked, who keeps you accountable? And he threw out his son and Tater. You think, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there were people in Seattle the last couple of years who were going to get on somebody if it absolutely required it. And there's evidence to suggest that there weren't those people. Like, who was going to Jamal Adams when that tweet and stuff was going on and saying, pack that in, you know, because it didn't really feel like that was there. Maybe one or two of the players did it. Or maybe they just thought, what a jerk thing to do and didn't say anything to him. Like, Pete Carroll never really seemed to take that that seriously. I mean, like, we don't know what happened behind closed doors, but he played the next game. Carol publicly backed him. Like, it didn't, what's going on here? Like, it didn't feel as if there was really a strong voice on the coaching staff laying down the law, so to speak. And I think in the past, there probably were coaches, Ken Norton, for example, or players, LOB, you know, Wagner. I'm sure Bobby Wagner is, was still a strong voice last year, but, you know, 10 years ago, I think there were a lot of players who probably policed that locker room themselves and kept standards high and got after it. Now, whether Ryan Grubb can do that or not, I don't know. I'm just saying. I think he probably has to, you know, think about how he's going to go about this, which I'm sure he will do. Look, I'm not telling the man how to do his job. I'm just saying something that, I think he's going to need to be considered as he goes into this next role. But like I say, I'm not that bothered about it. You know, I don't think everything has to be flowers and sunshine all the time. It's the NFL. It's tough. It's difficult. You need players who are resilient. You don't want to make their lives miserable. But if someone isn't getting the job done, sometimes they need to, to be told that. And they need to be pressured to improve. So I don't think it's it's a massive issue at all. Um, back to the scheme point. The one thing I really like about this hire is I think it speaks to something I've talked about a lot. I think Schneider wants his offense and it is his team. Mike McDonald's the head coach, but John Schneider is 
crafting the vision. I think he wants an explosive offense. I think he wants point scoring. I think he wants to attack teams. And I think he and Mike McDonald will be lockstep in that because Mike McDonald has had first-hand experience of how his defense benefits from that kind of thing with Baltimore. The Ravens produced a season in 2023 where their defense had 88 snaps when they were trained in a game. That's obscene. That's like a game and a half. So for pretty much the whole season, the Ravens' defense had the advantage of not having a play from behind. So, I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy good. But it shows that the offense in, in built up a lot of scoreboard pressure to help the defense. I don't think the Seahawks under McDonald, I've seen this said and written, want a conservative offense that is, is going to be of the kind that you would expect a defensive-minded head coach to run. I think it is going to be a lot more explosive, aggressive, getting after teams for the reasons that I've said. Now, I was reading some stats on ESPN, on, on Schefter's article on this. You know, the Huskies threw the ball like 61% of the time or something, or drop back 61% of the time. You know, big on yardage in the passing game. Running game was more of a compliment than anything else. Could it be that way in Seattle? It could be, but I don't care. Like, you know, they don't have to set records for running. And the problem with Pete Carroll was that he always implied that he wanted that and then never committed to it. He never saw it from his teams. So if the Seahawks set out to pass a lot and then pass a lot, who cares? Like that's if they're doing what they do, what I don't want to do is them come out every week and say, we've got to run the ball better, we've got to run the ball. Hey, we need to commit to the run and then not do it. So I don't really care whether they throw or run or whatever. It's the, you know, stick to your principles is what I would say. And I think there is going to be a lot of throwing and there is going to be attacking and there is going to be an attempt to get a lot of explosive plays. And that's why I think one of, another reason why Ryan Grubb is here, because he's shown that he can do that. So what does that mean moving forward? As I have said already numerous times, some agree, some don't mind it, some hate it. I I genuinely think there's a chance they're going to draft a quarterback and they're going to go in that direction. And it's not just about being explosive. I think it's about reducing cost of quarterback. You know, that is where you, if you are looking everywhere to find an edge and they've talked about that, that is where you can find an edge when you have a quarterback who's earning a few million dollars or whatever or less versus Gino on 31.2 million this year. And again, whenever you bring up the future genos, I did that in my video the other day, people react very badly to that. It's a pure business thing. You know, is Geno Smith worth 31.2 million? If, if Drew Locke's on five, is it a $26 million difference for a bridge quarterback? These are the kind of things the Seahawks have to consider. Yes, I appreciate there's going to be dead money attached, but because there's dead money attached, if you move on in a year's time, if you draft a quarterback, if their intention is to draft a quarterback, you have to include the, the dead money that will be in the following year that you're going to save as well by making the move now. So these are all the things that, you know, I still think there's a good chance that Geno Smith will be traded before March 18. That's the way that I think this is going to go. I think they will re-sign Drew Locke. I think they will draft a quarterback. I think they will open up a competition between Drew Locke and the quarterback and maybe another cheap veteran and that is what the approach will be. And I think that they are going to have growing pains on defense and offense. So if you are going to have growing pains with new systems and new schemes, why not get the growing pains of the quarterback out of the way as well when he's a rookie this season too? That is the way that I think they will go. I do think there's a good chance Michael Penix will be a Seattle Seahawk in, and people will put two and two together and say, ah, you're getting five instead of four. I think there's a very good chance that Penix will come to Seattle. And listen, I don't. I will I keep mentioning this, and I, this I'm not saying it to be cocky. It's not, not, not nothing to do with that. I don't think anybody has gone into more detail to look at the cons with Michael Penix than I have. You know, usually the conversation with why you would want him is restricted to injury history, age, or the fact that he's left-handed. I wrote a three thousand five hundred word article detailing sort of the, the problems he had this season. You know, he had a whole run of games where his completion percentage sank, that he was 
just throwing it into areas rather than aiming it to, you know, placing the ball into areas where receivers could get it. You know, go and read the article. You know, just go and search Michael Penix Seals draft blog. You'll, you'll probably find it. It was after the Texas game that I wrote the article. So I, when I, the reason I mention all of that is that when I talk about the Seahawks potentially drafting Michael Penix, know that I am not just blinded by Huskies, Ryan Grubb, local guy, arm. You know, I've thought about this a lot, the pros and the cons. But that arm is special. And John Schneider saw something in Patrick Mahomes that a lot of people didn't see. Because Patrick Mahomes, again, I'll keep saying this, was not in Daniel Jeremiah's top 50 a month before he was drafted. And right before the draft, the week before the 2017 draft, he had him, Patrick Mahomes as a late first rounder. People were not looking at Mahomes and the arm and the talent and the potential. They were looking at maybe spread offense. Is this going to translate and stuff like that? And mistakes are made at quarterback all the time. That's how Christian Ponder ends up in the top 15. So the point I'm making is that when you actually look at Michael Penix's arm, it is sensational. He makes throws that I, this is not hyperbolic. I've not seen other quarterbacks make, including Mahomes. And Mahomes does things that Michael Penix can't do. But <laughs> like, there are just certain throws, like, like I think I mentioned it in the other video, when he's like dropping back against Oregon in the in the Pac-12 championship game. He's under pressure. Flick of the wrist, ball, perfect. Sort of the left sideline. Hits an on-rushing Jalen McMillan who'd separated. That's an unbelievable throw. Throwing lead passes in between defenders to the sideline. Rocket, like if it was... If there were like two less reps on that football, it gets tipped or picked, but you can just fire it in there. The way he fires passes across the middle in the red zone. Yes, he needs to be better in the intermediate level. Yes, he's not going to dink and dunk you. Yes, I think sort of two-minute drills in the NFL might be a bit of an issue that he has to work on there because he is a big play specialist. But if you can produce a running game and you bring those safeties up, I think he could be bombs away, explosives every week, highly dynamic, huge weapon. And that's what I think John Schneider is looking for. So I think he could easily be Seattle's pick. And when I say Seattle's pick, could it be 60? Maybe. Could it be after they trade it down 10 spots? Yeah. Could they trade down 10, 15 spots, get a second round pick for trading down, take them in round two? Yeah. Could they take them in round three if you last there? Yeah. It's all on the card. Like, this is the same with Bo Nix and Rattler. They went top 20, or if they went round three, I wouldn't be surprised. Same with J.J. McCarthy. The range with these quarterbacks is crazy. It's really hard to pinpoint where I think they're going to go because they, it's all across the board. Now, he isn't a... His escapability isn't great. He's not somebody who's going to scramble, scramble, scramble. Throw it. He's a better athlete than people realise. 38-inch vertical, I was told, when I was at Washington. Um, and, you know, he he showed subtle manipulation in the pocket. You know, against Texas, the, there was that one play that everyone remembers. Avoided pressure, threw it perfectly down the middle. You know, so he's got that in his locker. He's just not going to be Allen, Mahomes, Herbert, you know, those types. Scrambling around. I don't even know if it'd be Brock Purdy scrambling around, frankly, but the arm is special. Now, and, and also, look, if you are transitioning to Ryan Grubb's offense, you know, what better way to have that smooth transition than to have Michael Penix? And one of the other problems with Penix was always been, he's only ever played in this offense forever. The DeBoer offense in Indiana and at Washington. What's he going to do when he tries to learn a new offense? Well, if it's the same concept, the same language, it's, you know, you don't have to worry as much about that. So I think the rest of the league is going to be so intrigued now to learn how the Seahawks have evaluated Michael Penix. If they pass on him, like in the first, well, if they pass on him and he lasts, it's going to put teams off. Because if Ryan Grubb, if the team that Ryan Grubb is coaching with the player in the backyard, people are going to be like, eh, unless it's just an injury thing. But teams are also going to be wondering how high are they going to take this guy? Should we be taking if they if they're willing to take him like in the first round? Should we be willing to take him in the first round? And there may be a bit of bit of noise that maybe just pops up, whether it's correct or not. The Seahawks are thinking of taking Michael Penix early, and that'll make other teams think, "Oh, you know, should we be thinking about that?" Just because of 
you know, teams are going to be really, really intrigued and suspicious and uh, fascinated to see how the Seahawks view Michael Penix. What I will say is Bo Nix has a great arm. Bo Nix is a better scrambler. Bo Nix has some things that, you know, I think there will be some teams who have Bo Nix in round three. And there will be some teams that have Bo Nix in the top 20. And I can see why. Even in that easy offense. I mean, if you watch the senior ball and that flea flicker, he launches the ball 60 yards on a dime. It's unbelievable. That is a world-class arm as well. Now, it's not as good as Penix's, but the fact that he can get the ball downfield like that on a flea flick was just showing off. It's, it's a great arm. So, won't rule him out. Wouldn't rule Spencer out there out. JJ McCarthy's worked with Mike McDonald. Wouldn't rule him out, although I think he's a third-round pick and he's a bit meh. Also wouldn't rule out the fact that Ryan Grubb is bringing Scott Huff over and he used to be an offensive line guy with an offensive line background, whether that is their focus. And Powers Johnson, Tanu, you know, people like that could easily imagine them being targets on the first round. Maybe the ideal is to trade down in, in round one, get somebody like Powers Johnson in the 20s maybe, try and get back in a round two, get your quarterback there. Who knows? Who knows? What I will say, it's a really deep offensive line class. So, like, when I put a mock draft out, and I'm really a seven-rounder the other day, and there's, like, two offensive linemen who I love in this seven-rounder, and people are telling me, you need to focus on O-line, not quarterback. I've drafted two O-liners in the first three rounds. That's – the draft is good. It doesn't have to be the first round. You can draft offensive linemen elsewhere and still get great value. Everyone goes on about Detroit's offensive line, two guards – were not high picks. One was a cheap free agent on less than Phil Haynes. There was a third round pick. So just saying. Anyway, so the point being that I do think that this hire does hint towards, again, the chance of the quarterback on top of John Schneider being lukewarm about Geno Smith. You know, neither John Schneider nor Mike McDonald said anything about Geno Smith in relation to next season. They didn't say, we're hoping for this next year, or he's our guy, or we, we're looking forward to him doing this in the offense. It, there was none of that. It was just John Schneider with a pretty tepid review of his last two seasons. And Mike McDonald saying, yeah, well, he's good in here because, well, I guess he's the Pro Bowl. He's got a late invite there. And uh, then mentioning Drew Locke. And then seeing, we'll see how the situation plays out. They had, listen, Schneider itching to draft a quarterback. I think they're going to draft a quarterback. That's my prediction. We'll see. I think they're going to trade Geno Smith down the line. We'll see. They have a week. Of less than a week to sort this out with Geno Smith's contract if they want to restructure it. So we will see about that. But I think they're going to trade him in March rather than, uh, I think they'll go to the Combine, talk to teams like the Steelers, the Falcons, teams like that. See what they can get from, see what deal they can do with the bonus money attached or whether they eat some of that to get a better pick. We'll see, see what they can get. But that's what I think it's going to go. So anyway, that's my thoughts and everything. You know, it's not just Ryan Grubb there. You've had a bit of quarterback talk and everything like that. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's intriguing. It's mysterious. There's a bit of an unknown. I can't say whether the Seahawks have got this right or not. What I can say is that I'm more excited for this season than I have been in a long, 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 long time. So I'm going to take that and run with it. Enjoy the Super Bowl if you can. Um, I am going to do a stream, I think, with Jeff on Wednesday. So join us for that. It will be approximately 2 p.m. Pacific time. I think that's generally what we're we'll doing with Jeff. So... Stay tuned for that. If anything else breaks over the next few days, we will be here on the channel to talk about it. SeahawksDraftBlog.com for more analysis. Until next time, bye for now. Enjoy your weekend.